This Sunday, October the 4th, is World Communion Sunday. For those of you watching this video, you're invited to participate with us in an observance of the Lord's Supper at the end of this video. If you would like to gather at home the elements of bread and the cup, you'll be prepared to follow the instructions and participate in the Lord's Supper at the end of this worship video. We hope that this will be a meaningful time reminding us of our dependence upon the mercy of Christ and our unity as believers in this church and in the worldwide fellowship of Christians. Let us lift our hearts to God in worship. Almighty and all-loving God, you have sent out your word to us that we may know you and have life in your presence. Accept our prayers of praise, thanksgiving, and adoration that we may unite with all creation in giving honor, worship, and glory to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hello. I've been asked to deliver a talk on Christian stewardship today. I hope to encourage all to examine ways in which to expand on ideas of stewardship in giving and in service, knowing all belongs to God. To be honest, I do a slight eye roll when I see myself through the lens as a steward in the body of Christ and all that entails. I used to strive to be a cheerful giver, giving from unimaginable abundance, but in all honesty, when comparing my giving to the generosity I see in others, I have to say, in practice, I'm more like the widow who contributed two mites to the temple treasury, referenced in Mark 12 and Luke 21, giving all that I have out of my debt and poverty. I used to struggle with how hypocritical that made me because my faith should be stronger, more creative. I used to long for financial wealth, Long to have the mindset to attract to my 
self the abundance and to be enriched so that I could in turn share to enrich the kingdom of Christ. Abundant giving, abundant living, peace, prosperity that surpasses all understanding, blah, blah, blah. If only it were that simple. Through my learning and growing, stewardship has come to mean more than me than just tithing faithfully. I have become more focused on giving of myself to the service of others in his kingdom. Some of you may know my background and how I came to join University Baptist Church. I remember clearly back to 2004, arriving in North Carolina with barely a quarter in my pocket and having to lean on the kindness of friends until I gained employment, shelter, and stability. That was a very, very, very humbling experience. But God blesses, God establishes, and God kept me secure through these very, very insecure and sometimes scary situations. And fast forward to today, and 16 years of ever-increasing faith, and here I am, eight months into a worldwide pandemic, and many, many people are facing those exact same scary circumstances. This practice of stewardship has taken on a whole new meaning today, heck, hasn't it? And I ask God to show me how to use my experience to help those facing extreme hardships, such as I, such as I had experienced. God knows how to prepare us through challenges that come our way. Prior to COVID, opportunities to serve were abundant in the church, the local community, with family, friends, and sometimes strangers. I miss coming to Sunday school and attending church. And no matter how many times I wanted to sleep in and not come, the effort to prepare and partake in church has always been rewarded. I receive unspoken blessings when I'm resisting that level of laziness. I've come to internalize that formula of giving. You receive abundance when you give, as if giving to God with a cheerful heart. There were so many ways to involve myself with the ministries here at UBC and learned of opportunities via the bulletin board, newsletters, or word of mouth. I mean, I had a solid calendar full of regular services to volunteer weekly and throughout the month. Stewardship allows us to share our gifts, talents, and skills. I love to cook. The Interfaith Community Kitchen, I miss going to that on first Sundays to prepare lunch with whatever we could pull together and always turning out a good plate full of nutritious food. I miss fellowship with strangers who, for that day, were like family catching up with each other's lives, sharing concerns, offering prayer. I really miss the IFC. I love to sing. <laughs> Wednesday night fellowship, followed by choir practice. Oh, how I miss choir. The torture, the blessings. With just these few activities, my faith deepened as well as my ability to listen, hear, and see others' needs, and lend myself to the service of others. 16 years have me prepped to re-up and re-enlist, and in the face of COVID, serve while self-isolating. And it's amazing how opportunities to serve will pop up. As I think on how to continue in service, the intimidating thoughts of moving outside my comfort zone and to reach to those who are suffering. So I'll make a call. I'll check up on someone who's going through it. Listening matters still ministering to needs. It all belongs to Christ. And here's a reading from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on the earth, in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. 
So I invite you all to pray and meditate on how to use the many, many ministries available at University Baptist and throughout the community. Consider online outreach ministries, volunteer opportunities through nonprofits and the hospitals, Zoom with the elderly care visitation, letter writing, sending cards. The prison, prison ministry um, offers opportunities to reach out. Zoom fitness channel, set, Zoom fitness sessions for the elderly, and babysitting for working parents and essential workers, food banks and pantries, volunteer work. The need is very great. We are all called to be good stewards for such a time as this. Thank you. Good morning. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4, 7 through 9, and 12 through 20. The Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet, covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin the word of God for the people of God. Psalm 19, about Psalm 19, the great C.S. Lewis says, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. It's structure, six verses about nature, five about law and four of personal prayer the psalm proceeds through those different subjects without any transition, but in the psalmist's mind, they're all very, very interrelated. Hope you are blessed by this. It's kind of a long psalm, but I pray that it blesses you today. Psalm 19. Heavens declare the glory of God. The skies all proclaim God's handiwork. Day to day they testify. Night after night they tell of it. There is no speech nor even word. Nothing our ears could ever discern, yet their voice goes out over the earth, their testimony to all of the world. And the heavens tent he has set for the sun which comes forth like 
like a bridegroom and like an athlete joyfully runs completing its circuit which warms all the earth oh the law of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple, the decrees of the Lord are righteous, giving joy to the heart, the commands of the Lord are giving light to the eyes. They are more precious than even gold. All of the gold in the world sweeter as well and fine honey dripping from the One of my professor friends teaches an Old Testament course to college freshmen and sophomores every semester. He decided he wants his students to know the Ten Commandments before they finish his course, and so he puts a question on the first test of every semester. The question is, list the Ten Commandments in any order. However, one semester, a student wrote his answer to that question and said, number seven, number five, number nine, number two, and so on. So my friend had to rewrite his question. It's not just college freshmen, however, who don't feel burdened by the need to remember all of the Ten Commandments. Many surveys report that only four out of 10 American Christians 
are able to identify the content of all ten of the commandments. There are many reasons for this. Many people have mixed views of the Ten Commandments. Some see them as a burden that weighs them down with restrictions. Some see them as a kind of legalism that refuse, reduces faith to keeping a few rules. One thing is for sure, however, people who don't believe they need to know all Ten Commandments probably don't feel burdened to keep all ten either. What difference would it make if we not only remembered the Ten Commandments, but also followed them? And not only followed them, but cherished them and wove them into our characters and into our lives. I think we can better appreciate what the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy call the ten words, if we realize that these ten words have one goal. The goal of the Ten Commandments is freedom. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is the same purpose as the Exodus event itself. The same God who set Israel free from slavery gave them a mission to reveal God's character and God's will to all the nations of the world. God gave them the Ten Commandments to help them to live as free people and to show us how we can be free as well. Now, you may be shaking your head. Most people don't think of the Ten Commandments until somebody steals their bicycle. When we do think of the Ten Commandments, we don't necessarily think of freedom. Most people think of the most common phrase they hear in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not. They sound like a list of rules. They remind many people of H.L. Mencken's famous definition of Puritanism which he described as the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. That view, while popular, is superficial, however. The deeper reality is that the Ten Commandments are God's enduring charter of freedom. To see the link between the Ten Commandments and freedom more clearly, we need to look no farther than the very first commandment in Exodus 20, verse 2. It begins, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Like the manna in the wilderness and the water from the rock, the Ten Commandments are one more of God's gifts to the people of Israel on their journey from slavery to freedom. There are many features of the Ten Commandments that emphasize freedom. First, there is the limited number of commandments. There are not 500. There are not 100. There are 10. You can count them on your 10 fingers. They don't micromanage our lives. Instead, they walk us around the broad boundaries of our freedom and say to us, see how much room God has given you to live in. It may seem counterintuitive, but the negative form of the commandments emphasizes our freedom as well. The negative, thou shalt not, actually allows for greater freedom. A positive commandment, do this, gives us very little wiggle room. When it says, do this, then that's what we must do. The negative commandments say, you can do anything you want, as long as you don't do these few things. The commandments do not box us in. 
They show us that God's freedom is deep and wide. While there are ten commandments, there are two major kinds of freedom that they offer to us. First, the Ten Commandments offer us the freedom from being our own God. Judaism considers the first commandment to be the words in verse 2, I am the Lord your God. Unless we recognize that the Lord is our God, we will try to be God for ourselves. The first four commandments define the right relationship between Israel and God. Israel had lived under a system that worshiped people and things in the place of God. That kind of worship had made them slaves. The God who proved to be the one true God was the God who set them free. The freedom from not being our own God is a different kind of freedom than what most people understand freedom to be. We usually define freedom as the freedom to do what we want to do. The problem is, how do you know that you're free to do what you want unless you do that thing? When freedom is the freedom to do what we want, we must do what we want in order to know that we are free. And soon our wants become our masters and we become their slaves. The Ten Commandments describe a different kind of freedom. Not the freedom to do what we want, but the, the freedom to want what God wants for us. And God wants us to be free. Years ago, Psychology Today magazine described a session between a therapist and a young man whose endless pursuit of pleasure had led to relationship chaos, substance abuse, and broken health. His therapist suggested his life didn't have to be this way. As he spoke, a light seemed to come on in the young man's mind. He suddenly said to his therapist, you mean that I don't have to do what I want to do? St. Augustine captured this idea of freedom in his teaching about the right order of our loves. As people made in the image of God, we're created to love as God loves. Our problem, St. Augustine said, is that we love the wrong things. He taught that we should love God first and then do what we wanted to do. Because if you love God first, our other wants will fall into their proper order. That's much like the teaching of the Ten Commandments. A good example of the freedom the commandments give us from ourselves is the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day. If we are responsible for playing the role of God in our lives and we are the ones who have to make everything work out the way they should, well then, who can ever afford to take a day off? The God of the Exodus, however, told his people, I am the Lord, your God. You can rest from work and worry. I'll take care of governing creation while you enjoy my gift of Sabbath rest. And when we practice letting God be God one day a week, soon enough, we learn to recognize God as God on the other six days as well. The Ten Commandments free us from our need to be our own God. They also free us to love our neighbors. The person who believes that God will take care of them 
is free to care for other people. The point of the Ten Commandments is not to give religious people rules that they use to police their neighbors. The commandments were given to God's people to free our neighbors from having to police us. The commandments free us to love our neighbors by showing us what loving our neighbors looks like. First of all, the love of neighbor begins at home. The commandment to love our parents and to honor our parents, especially in their elder years, shows us how to love one another. The commandments teach us that our worth is greater than our work so that we can honor and care for our parents and for the aged when the ability to work has ended. Loving our neighbor means protecting our neighbor's life, protecting our neighbor's marriage, protecting our neighbor's property, and protecting our whole community from the corrosive acid of false witness and lying that eats away at the common good. The Ten Commandments free us to love God and to love our neighbor by showing us what the love of God and the love of neighbor look like. The Ten Commandments also teach us how we can gain access to this freedom. The third commandment, to honor God's name, teaches us how we can keep the other commandments. When we try to keep the commandments in our own power, we realize that we can't do it ourselves. This helps us to realize just how much we need God day by day and minute by minute. And so God has given us the gift of God's name so that we can call on God at any moment for help, for forgiveness, and for wisdom every moment of every day. One question that almost everyone wants to answer is what is God's will for my life? The Ten Commandments answer this question clearly and emphatically. The God of Israel and the God of Jesus want us, wants us to be free. Free to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And free to love our neighbor and to love ourselves. Thanks be to God. Amen. God of mercy and healing, you who hear the cries of those in need, receive these petitions of your people that all who are troubled may know peace, comfort, and courage. We pray today for all who suffer from illness and who need your healing power. We pray for all who suffer from COVID-19 and its devastating effects. For all who have lost loved ones to this terrible disease. And for all who've been isolated and who have lost their livelihoods and means of support as a result of its many repercussions. We pray for the President and First Lady of the United States that you would help them to recover from COVID and we pray for all in their family and staff and contacts who are also sick or at risk. We lift up to you our nation in a time of many crises and a time of decision. And we ask for your wisdom, guidance, and mercy in this hour. We ask for your blessings of freedom and flourishing to be extended to all people of the earth. For you are the creator and redeemer of us all and you love each person you have made. Having heard the voice of your beloved Son, who calls us to life through trust and obedience in His way, we ask for a fresh gift of faith, courage, and strength to answer His call 
and live as agents of peace and reconciliation in a divided and hurting world. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us how we ought to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear these words of invitation to the table. Here is the table of the Lord. We are gathered to his supper, a celebration of things eternal. Come when you are fearful to be made new in love. Come when you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come when you are regretful and be made whole. Come old and young, for there is room for all. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your infinite mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. In remembrance and gratitude for your love poured out for us, we offer you these gifts of bread and cup. Sanctify them as signs to us of your saving grace through Jesus Christ and sanctify us by your Holy Spirit, that we may serve you in unity and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Teacher, te scripture teaches us that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. As we partake, let us remember Christ's body broken for you. Scripture also says, that in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. the cup of the Lord's Supper, the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you, and may the peace of Christ be with you. Amen.